All righty. Welcome to the Integrated Innovation Network's Startup Stories. My name is Siobhan Curran and I'm the manager of the University of Newcastle's um, I2N. Before we jump into the event, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm hosting this event um, or virtual event uh, from the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people. And I also acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. You can also show your respect and awareness of country you're joining us from by letting us know in the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And that chat, chat function is also where you can connect and comment with other people who are attending this um, event as well. So for those of you that are new to the I2N, we're an initiative of the University of Newcastle, and we have the central aim of being a catalyst for regional transformation through enterprise skill development, new venture creation and entrepreneurship. At the heart of I2N is a strategically positioned entrepreneurship centre in Newcastle CBD, um, which we'd be joining you from today if um, circumstances allowed, but nevertheless, we uh, transitioned all of our programming into uh, virtual environments like Zoom. Um, but when we can get back to our I2N hub at Honeysuckle, uh, it's where we offer co-working facilities that are complemented by mentoring and a series of connection events like Startup Stories and cohort-based programs, which cover in individual enterprise skill development, pre-startup creation, new venture establishment and acceleration. Uh, we also develop programs, deliver programs rather, for innovation development for existing SMEs as well. So all industry sectors are supported, um, they extend beyond traditional tech-based startups to include social innovation and creative industries as well. Um, and you don't have to be affiliated with the University of Newcastle to participate in our programs or events. So in just under five years of operation and with the support of the New South Wales government's Boosting Business Innovation Program, the I2N's welcome more than 4,000 innovators and entrepreneurs from a range of different industries and sectors at a variety of different stages of their journey. Um, and we've helped fuel, grow and graduate more than 104 teams. They've raised over $18.6 million in funding. Um, they foster the creations of dozens of jobs and work integrated learning opportunities for our students. They're acquiring customers, they're winning awards, they're growing their teams, and they're developing their products and solutions that are delivering real world impact right here in the Hunter. Um, so if you want to know more about the I2N, you can head to our website, newcastle.edu.au slash I2N. Now onto our event, a little outline on the format of this morning's event. So we've taken a number of questions from attendees at registration, and we'll be leading with those after our speaker provides a brief background of their startup journey. And then we'll open it up to any questions that have been asked um, via Zoom in the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. So one good thing about virtual events is that I don't need to point you to the bathrooms or the fire exits. If you're at home, you should already know the drill. So our guest this morning is Phil Island. He's the co-founder and CEO of Hone Carbon a mission-driven business that has the objective of unlocking the potential for carbon storage in Australia's agricultural environments. Phil and his team are addressing the technical barrier to soil carbon sequestration projects by designing and deploying world-leading soil carbon measurement solutions. Hone Carbon has attracted significant investment and they're rapidly scaling their solutions to customers in Australia and around the world, unlocking the potential for carbon storage in Australia's agricultural environments. Welcome, Phil, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us at Startup Stories this morning. Hello, thank you. Over to you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending a Zoom meeting at 8 a.m. during the week. Um, that's very committed. I trust my deck is sharing. It's not it sharing is, thank you. All the other things on my computer screen. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Phil and I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of Hone Carbon uh, from Newcastle originally and I've worked and lived in a range of places and came back here a few years ago. To start talking about my journey, I thought I'd just draw your attention to this picture. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was taken a few weeks ago and it is a photo of raindrops on the windscreen of a snowplow at the very top of the Greenland ice cap. As far as we know, it's never rained on the top of Greenland before. Um, waterfalls as ice and, and snow. And it was raining up there. Obviously, Greenland is experiencing increasing heat and melting, et cetera. 
but I thought this photo is a really stark warning and indication of the changes that our planet is undergoing. This photo is relevant to me because I've spent probably the last 15 years from my first undergraduate course at Newcastle University through to now trying to make a contribution or participate in efforts to address the climate crisis. That journey's seen me work mostly, to be frank, in the not-for-profit sector um, with Oxfam and, and other NGOs engaged in climate advocacy and campaigning. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've, I've moved back to Newcastle and through a range of strange events, I've ended up um, running a startup, a for-profit startup that is engaging in a different part of the climate problem. And that's what I'll talk about today. So as no doubt many of you are aware, climate change is a thing. Uh, and one of our species greatest challenges is not just to reduce carbon going into the atmosphere, but we also have to draw down, we have to draw it out of the atmosphere. Anytime you hear a government a, or a company refer to a net zero target, um, that's a commitment not just to reduce emissions, but also draw emissions out of the atmosphere. Traditionally, there have been a number of different ways to do that. Reforestation is, is the most commonly known one, um, but actually storing carbon in agricultural soils um, is increasingly talked about because it actually is our highest volume and lowest cost potential carbon sink. I believe there was a statistic out of the US Department of Energy recently that calculated that if we could simply increase soil organic carbon by 1%, just increase it by 1% in one meters depth of all the world's agricultural soils, we would remove around half of all the historical emissions of our species. Um, obviously that's an enormous task in itself, but it gives you a sense of the scope of, of carbon in agricultural soil. So the other reason soil carbon in agricultural soils is so good is because it reduces reliance on chemicals, often which are um, fossil fuel intensive. It increases the capacity for water retention. It enhances climate change adaptation and a range of other things. So this is the problem that my company's trying to address. The Australian government and a range of other um, institutions around the world have identified though, that the biggest barrier to unlocking significant drawdown opportunities in agricultural soils is the cost and complexity of measurement. Now that might sound like a fairly niche or, or small part of the problem, but, but it's actually really significant. If to enable a landholder or a farmer to get a carbon credit or participate in what are now multi-billion dollar carbon markets, you need to be able to verify and prove um, that you have increased the carbon of your soil and drawn carbon out of the atmosphere. And that requires you to very rigorously produce a baseline of the level of soil organic carbon in your farm, and then also prove and verify how much it's increasing. And then you have to prove that you're keeping it there as well. So obviously, if you were to increase soil carbon one year and let it all go the next, there's really no point in that, given that the earth is a closed system. So the company I'm working with is focused very much on the measurement challenge. Um, as Siobhan mentioned, our mission is to unlock the potential for carbon storage in agricultural environments to become a global leader in the measurement, verification and optimization of soil carbon projects. And we're doing this for the benefit of the land, its custodians and our shared atmosphere. Home carbon is very much a mission and impact driven business. And a lot of our initial investors share that um, sentiment and are also pushing on us to keep mission and impact driven. 
strangely, this company didn't start looking at soil carbon. It actually started looking at measuring a whole range of other things. And one of the key things the company measures is wheat, um, wheat, moisture, and protein. This is an example of Hone's grain measurement device. And I came along a year or two ago to advance their work on soils. The company had for many years been successful in developing spectroscopy as a measurement tool for a range of different analytes and things. And soil is another application that I've picked up and built a team with and, and we're really running at that challenge. But Hone is a business that was founded in Newcastle by three PhDs that I think all went through the University of Newcastle. And now we have our head office here and a number, a number of staff. Home Carbon, I should say, is a subsidiary in the broader, broader business. The, the, the rationale for carbon, but also for the broader business, is that traditional lab testing is capital and labor intensive. Um, it costs a lot. You've got to bag up your samples. You've got to put them in the post, send them to a lab. A verified technician has to work with those samples, use very expensive machines, that cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And it also costs you quite a lot of money to get a result. This is true for soil as well. So as I mentioned before, to generate a carbon credit, you have to prove your baseline of your carbon and prove that you've increased it. For a relatively small farm, a farmer would still need to send away hundreds of samples to verify this. And that is at a cost of often tens of thousands of dollars. And there are projects that are spending, I kid you not, hundreds of thousands of dollars on proper measurement of their soil carbon. That's not to mention all the disposable uh, materials that are used in the process. It's actually quite carbon intensive to bake soil. You've got to put soil in an oven, heat it to 100 degrees to, to find out the carbon and a range of other things. So Hone has a technology suite that sits across three primary platforms. We have a hardware solution, that's a spectrometer. Um, and I'm sorry, a spectrometer is hard enough word to say, let alone understand. So the, the kind of one 10 second explanation of that, it's a device that shines a really bright light against the substance. Um, that light then reflects off the substance to a sensor and tells the sensor things about that substance. Um, it's been a technology that's been around for 60, 70 years, but only in the last five years has the cost of this technology really, really reduced in the miniaturization of optics and, and a number of different chips available. So Hone and Hone Carbon's product offering is hardware. We have software as well. So when the sensor receives the data about the light or the reflection, you've got to, there's a very complicated set of processes to then turn that into usable information. And Hone has a proprietary machine learning platform in the cloud that enables us to turn that primary data into usable data. And we then have a number of platforms for customers, a mobile app and a desktop app to deliver those results. So Home Carbon is using these, is pursuing our mission by leveraging the proprietary pipelines for data analytics with our cutting edge portable hardware, mobile app and predictive machine learning engine. And our solution that we're rolling out enables low cost measurements of soil carbon and a range of other soil analytes on farm and in real time. And we are meeting what I believe is the world's most rigorous audit requirements legislated under the Australian Carbon Farming Initiative. Australia is really a world leader 
in regulation and legislation around soil carbon. Obviously, we have a significant interest in that, given we have such a large land mass and so much agriculture, but also Australia is really leading the way in finding ways for this to be verifiable and rigorous. So as we move forward in the kind of policy, international policy dimensions of climate change, we're going to find that it's not going to be enough to just claim that you've moved carbon out of the atmosphere. You've also got to prove it through an auditable trail that needs to be checked and verified. And Australia at the moment is really getting ahead of that game. And I believe under our legislation, we can generate soil carbon credits that are the only government credited credits that are valid under the Paris Climate Agreements. So we're very much at the forefront of that at the moment. In terms of Hone's journey, as I mentioned before, about a year ago now, we attracted um, several prominent seed investors. Um, we attracted people who were interested in impact investment. And that's something I've learned a lot in my journey is that there are a lot of both funds, but also individuals with significant wealth who are looking to use their money for good in the world. And we attracted these three initial seed investors to support us with our idea to move it forward to the next stage. Um, and it's fair to say after a year, by reducing the testing cost and complexity, Hone Carbon is catalyzing the uptake of soil carbon sequestration projects. And to give you a sense of what our product offering enables, we have moved from people having to send a sample to a lab to having a result in the field, to needing to wait one to three weeks to rapid results. We've reduced the cost per sample test from around $50 to $100 to $1 to $10. And we've significantly reduced the reporting burden and data trail by providing an online data platform that keeps that data auditable and safe from the beginning through to the end. It is disruptive technology and a disruptive capability in the truest sense of the word. This is a photo of the headless version of the device. Um, the technology is actually designed to be a whole of farm device. So the wheat device I showed you earlier is simply this device, but with a different head attachment. So there's one bit of hardware that can be used in a number of different ways. Um, we've demonstrated we can build spectroscopy models that accurately measure soil organic carbon and other soil properties in real time. In Australia, the requirements are that you can have a mean error of no greater than 0.3%, and we have well achieved beyond that. Um, and we've had a really clear technology pathway over the past um, year. And I, I know some questions have come through that have asked a little about this. We've stayed very focused on getting to where we need to be. And that started with having a production ready device that was QC'd and good to go, um, demonstrating pilot soil carbon calibration. So proving in field that our technology delivers in the way that we say it delivers. Then we set up a number of initial customers. Um, we have government organizations, the CSIRO is a customer of ours, our research organizations and soil contractors who are out there in the field drawing soil cars cores to measure soil carbon. We've achieved local calibrations um, for our product. It's a complicated thing to explain, but just trust me when I say we've achieved it. And now we're moving towards uh, building uh, regional and hopeful nas hopefully national calibrations so that you can take the device, the instrument anywhere in our country or other countries and measure soil organic carbon in real time. We believe the capability, the full suite of capabilities that we're unrolling in Australia right now is the first of its kind in Australia. And at the moment, we don't actually have a, a, a like for like competitor. 
But I should say there are lots of other actors in the space doing things similar to us or different ways to what we're doing. Um, but we really, we don't see those people as, or those companies as competitors. The soil carbon challenge is so big. Um, as I mentioned before, it's currently a multi-billion dollar market. And all estimates are that by the 2030s, carbon will be a multi-trillion dollar market. The challenge is enormous and we need everyone throwing everything they've got at it. So we actually collaborate with most of the people who you would traditionally consider are competitors. We've had great traction over the last six months. The first real sale, to be frank, was only back in March and or April. And we're scaling up the hardware that we're selling, the number of tests we're getting through, um, and the revenue and also our margin is growing over time. Some of our initial customers, we've actually now got customers also in France and the US. So our product has been used internationally, which I think is a real validation of what we're achieving as well, because in the European and the US market, there are other solutions and the fact that companies are still um, talking to us and wanting to roll out our tech, I think is a testament to the technology and what Hone's been able to achieve, but also a testament to Australian ingenuity and our ability to develop products that customers want and need. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I took about 10 minutes, which is what I was allotted. So thank you for bearing with me. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Phil. Listen, we've got lots of great questions. I'm going to just jump right in. Um, the, I, I know a lot of people on the, on the uh, Zoom today um, come from the industry, and I suspect they're wanting to know a, lot, a little bit more about the technology. So I'm going to jump into some of the tech questions that were asked at registration. So uh, Dane Steggles, who's a business manager at Benedict Recycling, is asking uh, what soil attributes other than chemical properties are favourable to CS and in what way, whether relating to the chemical process or another way? Right. That is a good question and also a multi-million dollar question. So how you increase, so, where, so we think about the carbon market in, in three different ways. We think about people who are uh, measuring carbon, so us, people who are making carbon, so how you produce it in the soil, and then people who are marketing the carbon. Under the Australian Carbon Farming Initiative, there are a number of methods that they promote people to do that can increase your soil carbon. This ranges from everything such as applying nutrients to the land, such as manure, um, remediating soils, rejuvenating pasture through seeding, um, altering the stocking rate, duration or intensity, um, moving to zero till agriculture, uh, retaining stubble after the crop is harvested and a few other things. So they're the methods that the regulator already recognizes. In addition to that, there's a lot of research currently going on around other techniques that could be used to increase soil carbon. A company that we work with that's really excellent that you should check out is called Soil Carbon Company. And they're working on fungi and um, endophytes that you can place or spray or apply onto seeds when they're put in the ground that then increases the amount the plant draws carbon. It's very complex and I'm not a biologist. Um, and there are a few other methods as well. There's also some liquid, some interesting liquid biofertilizers out there. Um, there's some soil aerators. If you just Google it, you'll find there are lots of companies trying to solve, solve for this problem. Uh, I'm just going to jump to a related question uh, around the tech that someone's asked from the audience. Um, so Benjamin T is asking, do you GPS localise where the soil has been tested in order to get an exact location of the measurement of the soil you've tested? Sometimes land's rich on some areas and poor on the other side. It can be seen visually when you grow corn crops, for example. Yeah, it's such a great question. So Everything is GPS located. Our device within it has a GPS sensor and a range of other sensors, including temperature and humidity. 
Um, no matter what method you're using for your soil project, your soil cores have to be tagged to a GPS location. I believe the regulation is within six meters, um, which a mobile phone can do. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, you can have variants even within a six meter space and certainly over a multi thousand hectare farm, there's significant variance. The way the Australian legislation accounts for that is by increasing the number of samples. So the more samples you have, you hope you then um, filter out any outliers. You might have a, a sample that's particularly gravelly, that doesn't have a lot of carbon. And the more samples you have, the, the better your averages are. And one of the great things about spectroscopy in our technology is that whereas traditionally, if you think every sample you're pulling out, it's gonna cost you $100 to get a result, you're not going to do too many of those through the mm. lab. You're going to be thinking every time that's a, that's a cost. Note. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but with spectroscopy, the cost per result is very low. So one of our value propositions is that we can greatly increase the resolution of data across a landholder's farm and actually decrease the variability and the impact of those outliers. There is within the Australian legislation what's called a variability discount. So if there is a high variability in your results, that can result in a significant discount against your carbon credit. Gotcha. So yeah, another good value proposition there as well for encouraging more testing. Um, Peter Morrissey in the Q&A chat has also asked, can your portable device look at other substances and in particular, uh, and my particular item is mineral oil? Mineral oil. I don't know about mineral oil. Our, our device is not, is definitely not just a soil carbon device. We measure a range of other soil analytes, pH, moisture, total nitrogen, potassium, and a range of other micronutrients. The grain version of the device measures um, moisture, oil, and oil content and protein. We do have a liquid device. There's a separate subsidiary of the company called Home Liquid. You should Google them. And they do measure any, well, any liquids, but their focus at the moment is essential oils, wine, and beer. So there is an ability of spectroscopy to measure, to measure liquids as well. Um, but I should say, as part of the startup journey, one of the challenges is staying focused. Yeah. And our technology can hypothetically measure anything. Mm. And there are lots of ideas around water testing, medical, construction. And it's really key that we stay focused, which is why Home Carbon is focusing so much on soil organic carbon. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I think... It's, it must be so exciting to be able to work on a technology that has such a huge um, range, but then trying to figure out how to prioritise. So actually, that's a really kind of like interesting point. Why focus initially on agriculture like Hone did um, to begin with? What Do you know what the decision around that was? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a question that would be best answered by the existing yeah. Hone founders. But my understanding is, agriculture had a really clear value proposition. That's what their existing PhDs were in. So they already gotcha. had expertise and networks in that space. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, just one more question and then I'll, from the Q&A and then I'll just jump back into the registration questions. Julia Waits asked, you mentioned challenges around measurement and validating projects that likely are holding farmers back from taking up carbon improving management. Are the indirect benefits like yield and productivity of a percentage increase in soil carbon not significant enough as a um, standalone incentive on farm? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. So there are a lot of farmers already who are increasing soil organic carbon. And, and also when I say soil organic carbon, I'm not talking about an obscure chemical. It's, it's literally the, the hummus in the soil, the roots, the bugs, the, all that stuff that makes up healthy soil. Mm. Lots of landholders have been increasing their soil organic carbon purely for those reasons for decades. Regenerative agriculture has been around for a long time. It's only in the past 
few years that there's been a really clear pathway to be able to monetize that through um, carbon credits. Proponents of regenerative agriculture would argue that over the long term, they are far better off financially um, due to the increasing yields, pest resistance, water retention, than using traditional more um, chemical intensive methods. But given that um, most people still use other methods, it's clear that that message either isn't compelling enough or hasn't got out there enough. But proponents of regenerative agriculture would certainly argue that those benefits are well, well worth it before you even look at the uh, environmental benefit. Yeah, I wonder how much of it is just habit and routine. Like this is how we've always done it. So why change it? Um, yeah, it's a bit of a culture shift, I suspect, as well. Um, so just jumping back to some of the registrant questions, um, for someone um, who uh, is CEO of a relatively new company, what surprised you most about your startup journey so far? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think I'd say two things. Uh, first is how transferable some of the skills from the not-for-profit sector were. I was surprised by... I think I viewed them as two very separate sectors with different skills and competencies, but actually the fundamentals around communication, fundraising, planning, prioritization, strategy, um, all kind of transfer. And I was actually encouraged by a colleague who'd made that um, shift to running startups from the not-for-profit sector and I'd certainly encourage others to try if they're interested. The, the other thing that I think surprised me in kind of the flip side of that coin is just how much there was to learn about some stuff about private company structures, everything from shareholder yeah. deeds, options, equities, safe warrants. There were words and ideas I had literally not encountered once in my entire life. Uh, and, but that was actually really exciting. So I could, it was like learning a whole new language. And yeah. I think that's been one of the really rewarding things about the journey is being able to learn all these new things. Craig uh, Hewitt, who's MD and Engage VR, is asking, what's the one thing that you would have done different to this point of the startup process? Yeah, so I think from day one, I would have been more strategic about exactly what I was putting my time into. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting reflection in hindsight because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. But for example, I put a relatively large amount of time into relatively small grants for which I probably didn't have a great likelihood of getting. Um, so I, I think just being really more judicious about what I put my time into and having better rubrics for prioritizing um, time. Um, we've got a question here from Sheila Parnham at Athena Cosmetics who's asked, how did you manage the fear of possible rejection when putting your ideas into the marketplace? Yeah, so I think, I think for me, it's just keep focused on the mission and the impact you're trying to have. I mean, I'm here to have an impact on climate and maybe it's with this product but maybe it's not um, and to be frank if this product fails and isn't great at measuring soil carbon which to be clear i think it is um <laughs> that's a good thing for everyone to know and and ultimately it's the marketplace and the customer that's going to validate mm -hmm. my ideas and my company's ideas so rejection is a really important part of the learning process and is a really important bit of information in, in in making your product as good as good as it can be yeah it's kind of a rejection's a good signal that you need to ask be asking more questions right yeah um arthav nafade i hope i've pronounced that correctly who's a student at the university of newcastle's asked were you entrepreneurial as a teen uh how did this all start yeah, so I certainly wasn't an entrepreneur in the traditional sense of the word, but I, but I was, I was in a way an activist and an advocate and a campaigner, and I was always lobbying for change, always writing letters to, to my local members or companies to ban plastic straws or, or whatever it was. So I suppose that's a type of entrepreneurialism, 
Um, it requires you to back yourself and have confidence to put yourself out there. And I think doing a startup certainly requires that yeah. because the very nature of the startup is that there is uncertainty and you don't know your product is new and you can't vouch for the fact that it's definitely going to be around in 10 years and excellent. So you've really got to back yourself and be confident to put yourself out there and sometimes make mistakes and for that to be okay. Yeah, I guess when you um, you know, have a passion for something, whether it's technology, your PhD, or something that, you know, injustices in the world or things that, you know, could be improved, um, it sort of stems from the same pool of passion, right? So uh, I think most successful founders would say that that's what it takes for you to be able to get through the hard slog of developing out a startup or making change to public policy if it's um, if, if that's something that's interesting you as well. Um, so I'm just going to move on to some business questions here. We've got uh, a question here from Albert James, who's the MD at Kochog Advanced Design, who's asking, generating interest for venture capital? Question mark. Are you generating interest for VC? Yeah. Uh, so we happen to be in a very hot space at the moment, and it, it was interesting and had a lot of interest a couple of years ago, but it's even more so now. So it's not almost every day a VC firm or investor reaches out to mm. try to invest. Now they're not they're not reaching out to give you money. They're reaching out to take a general, usually a equity stake for the lowest possible price. Um, so it's always always a balance. But we, we certainly have had no no difficulty attracting interest. And, and I would say at the moment, there is a lot of, of money out there in VC spaces and, and with individual um, cap, venture capitalists mm -hmm. and uh, interest rates are very low. So I think it's a, it's a very good time to be in a startup and trying to attract capital. So there are a lot yeah. of people who are willing to back some really interesting ideas. Yeah, and I think to the point you made earlier about your seed investors, and I know there are a couple um, on the on the call here who um, uh, invested early in Hone as well, um, that are really mission driven, and we're seeing impact investing having a huge moment right now because we've got a lot of people, um, you know, who can make investments that um, you know have had great success in their careers, and they're using this as an opportunity now to really make a difference in the world um, and so it's even interesting to see the UN coming up with um, you know their impact investing guidelines as well so um, yeah huge opportunity for mission driven companies that are really making impact in the SDGs as well. Um, we've got a question here too from sorry I just lost my spot Ben Maddox at Maitland City Council who's asking have you explored the use of your system as a measurement and verification method with clean with a with the clean energy regulator okay thank you Ben I uh, actually grew up in Maitland uh, so I um, spent the first 18 years of my life in Bora so it's nice to have someone from Maitland here um, the answer is yes we've been in communication with the clean energy regulator um, ever since the beginning and we're in active discussions about our capabilities and how it can be used. Our device obviously is um, acceptable under the current legislation and method, but my dream is that our device becomes the standard for soil organic carbon measurement, not just in Australia, but globally. And it's not just used in for landholders to um, increase their soil carbon, but it's also used by regulators to ensure that people are doing what they actually say they're doing. Mm. And within the international climate space, I think we're going to see a real increase of focus in verifying the claims that nations and companies are making around their emission reductions, both around what they're putting into the atmosphere and what they say they're drawing out. Because something that we know right now is that the numbers that countries are all submitting don't match up with what the atmosphere is seeing. We know how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and we know how much a whole range of other greenhouse gases are in there, like nitrous oxides, CFCs, and the numbers don't 
stack up as you would imagine. So I, I, as the climate crisis unfolds and the pressure to stay at or below a global average temperature increase of 1.5 degrees increases, I think we'll see more focus on the on the role of measurement and verification. Yeah, it's it's you got to action will only be taken against things that are measured, but it's figuring out what you measure. You know, that's the really important key. And actually, this is a kind of neat segue to the next question we've got, which is um, from Sean Riddick from Vector Energy Advisors, who's asking what are the metrics do you use to measure the performance of your company? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the, the, um, the answer I give first is indicative. And, and I thought about this question, actually. I have to say the number one thing really is customer satisfaction. Um, we rise or fall on the happiness of our customers. So our, our instrument and our technology needs to be delightful to use. And we don't have a future and the technology doesn't have a future without happy customers. So customer satisfaction is number one. And then the other metrics we use, some of them were displayed in my PowerPoint presentation, but the number of instruments we have deployed, the number of soil tests conducted, that's a really key indicator. We can sell instruments, but are people using it? Mm. Um, Ongoing subscriptions to our, to our technology and also customer referrals, um, which comes back to customer happiness. But there, there are a few things we measure. And it's interesting there, I didn't actually identify revenue or gross margin. And, and to be honest, they're not, they will become increasingly important but in the first couple of years, um, when you're going off grants and investment capital, they're not actually, in my experience, the most important things. They're not the fundamentals. They're they're the ends. They're not they're not the means. Mm. Um, we've got a question here from Declan Clausen, who's the Deputy Mayor, uh, sorry, Deputy Lord Mayor of Newcastle. Welcome, Declan. He's asking, how can we help you scale faster? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, I suppose, <laughs> I mean, the number one way anyone in government can help us is help us to navigate the very complex world of federal government grants. <laughs> I know I know the council also has to, to navigate. You're a, you're a grant applicant and recipient, but it really is challenging. And I know even within the Newcastle City Council region, there are a lot of startups who have applied for a lot of federal government grants. And just as an example of the problems of the process is you just don't know how many people are applying. So sometimes there can be a small grant for one or $200,000 that requires, and I kid you not, tens to hundreds of pages of mm -hmm. submission. And then the department may already have in their mind who they're giving the grant to, or, or there have been 10,000 applicants for, for five grants. There are a lot of ways these processes can be improved. One really simple way is having a letter of interest stage where people can put forward an initial letter of interest and then the government narrows down to maybe 100 applicants for 10 grants. There, there's a lot of really practical ways. So I think helping having some kind of grants or grant support gateway, I think could be really, really good. And I'd, I'd say the same to I2N. I think it would be really good for unlocking um, potential and investment in this region. Yeah, it's certainly something uh, we've facilitated a, a grant recently for the New South Wales government. And um, yeah, people really struggle with writing grants, no matter how many times they've actually written grants before. And um, some, I kind of use the analogy, you know, it's almost like you're auditioning, you're an actress auditioning uh, in a movie and sometimes it's not you, it's just, you know, they're looking for something in particular. <laughs> it's not you, it's them kind of thing. Uh, and so it doesn't matter how well you write the grant, if, if you don't have that one thing, it is that special magic that they're looking for, um, you know, you won't be successful. And it's not that you're bad at writing grants, it's just the grant's not right for you. Um, and so it can be really challenging for people who are making these, you know, putting in efforts to make applications for grants to be constantly rejected um, because it's just sometimes the parameters of the grant, like what the assessment criteria is, is just not fit for what it is that you're exactly working on. Uh, and sometimes reading the web page or the um, guidelines, it's not apparent to you that you're not the right fit. So just having someone to talk to to say, is this worth my time? 
is um, is really can be really important as well. Um, but yeah, totally take your point on grant writing. It's really um, a big can be a big time suck. Um, We've got a question here from Elizabeth McDonald at Chalk and Berent, who's asking what's been the hardest challenge so far? Um, it has, I mean, look, spectroscopy is hard enough to say, let alone understand. <laughs> and, and no matter how many times I explain it and lay awake at night trying to think about it, it's, it's very complex and we're lucky in that we have a number of customers who are in this space and are invested in understanding it for the for the cost and complexity disruptions but we also have a lot of customers landholders farmers who this is it's it's really hard to understand it doesn't mm. it doesn't make sense and to get people past that tech that technical barrier to really understand what it is and its usefulness is is quite challenging and it can take a lot of time and a lot of money to to really prove it mm. so i think i think just initially proving it and particularly because what we're doing has no like for like competitor mm. in australia and in some ways it seems too good to be true um we've really got to prove it so i'd say that is that has been the most challenging thing yeah i kind of liken it to some new technology like the iPod or, you know, um, the iPhone when it came out, it's not until you, is, do you find when you get, when you get the product in the hands of the user, and like you said, there's that sort of um, magic that happens. They like, they see it, they use it. You know, you might have to take them through the steps on how to use it, but you get, you get them to that point and they see the result and they're like, okay, there's that delight that they get. And that's when they're convinced. Is it, is it more around getting the tech in their hands than getting them to understand how the tech works? Yes and no. I mean, I wish our product was as delightful as an iPod <laughs> and what I do for some development time from uh, the Apple tech team, but it is if they're invested in understanding it and have mm. the, the device and the, the, the mobile app and samples we can test, yes, then it clicks. But it requires a number of pieces coming yeah. together. It also requires a desire mm. to understand and a curiosity and, and interest. Um, how, so sorry, this is a question from Judy and Osborne, who's an academic at the University of Newcastle. She asks, how do we make fighting climate change compatible with earning a living on a big scale and for lots of people? Big question. Right, just a little, uh, a little question for, um, for the end. Uh, look, I, I've been on a real journey with this exact question, actually, um, and my answer 10 years ago was all about governance and supranational governance and, and policy and, and people making sacrifices. I, I've come to learn over time that the, the private sector and the market has a really important and powerful role to play mm -hmm. in this challenge. And I think that's demonstrated in no greater than in, in renewable energy. There are many examples of, of governments and government organizations trying to roll out renewable energy and, and just not doing it fast enough. But the private sector really has expedited the rollout of renewables. You look in Australia, the uptake of rooftop solar, for example. Um, I, I think there are a lot of decent good companies and good people in decent companies that can do a lot. And I see... I mean, depending on your view of view of economics and 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 growth, um, a, a theme that's kind of predominant in in the UNFCCC and the UN at the moment, particularly around the SDGs, is the idea of green growth, the idea of creating mm -hmm. new jobs and new economies and new capital within um, within a, a framework of fighting climate change. And, mm -hmm. and if you just think about it the number of jobs that can be created through a clean energy transition to, to renewable energy, to the electrification of our car network, to drawing carbon out of the atmosphere, that the possibilities are, are endless. So I actually don't, whereas I used to ask that exact question, I now think that 
climate change, dare I say, being major, a major challenge is also an opportunity to create jobs and create livelihoods um, and scale scale flourishing lives for, for more people. Um, I totally agree with that sentiment and as something actually that really changed um, my perspective on this um, was a talk that was recently given um, um, by our former chief scientist, um, Dr. Alan Finkel. Um, so there's a recording of it. I'll, we'll, we'll post a link to it um, when we send out a recording of this particular talk to registrants today because it really gave me a lot of hope that in climate change and addressing um, using technology to address climate change, there's actually so much opportunity and possibility for us to make that difference and still um, be able to create jobs and have economic prosperity as well. Um, there's a question here from Matt Barry, who's the founder of Actified, and he's asking, can you describe some of the challenges you face building a business in such a political sector? Yes. Uh, so I've, as I've always worked on climate, it's, just, it's always been kind of politics uh, and very comfortable in that space. But, but I have to say, I'm surprised by how um, bipartisan soil carbon is. Of, of all the political complexities with the issue of climate change, yeah. soil carbon appears to be the only issue that all the major political parties can agree with. I actually, I call it a tetrapartisan, it's not bipartisan, <laughs> it's tetrapartisan because you've got the Greens, the Nationals, Labor and Liberals all in favour of this because you're improving the land, you're improving the environment, you're um, generating new streams of revenue and capital for farmers, you're investing in our regions and you're helping the country get to its, um, dare I say, in, in my personal view, um, inadequate international greenhouse gas emissions goals. So everyone wins. And I, I don't think you find many, many issues like, like that. So it, it hasn't very been lucky. challenging. It's, yeah. been, it's been rewarding. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to let's try and get through as many of the questions left over in the Q&A from our live audience today. We've got about five minutes. So let's do this in rapid fire. Richie Williams asking, what are the key benefits of high level, fully enclosed hydroponic farming to the carbon reduction and sustainability of land use? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to have to be honest and say, I don't know. I don't okay. know much about um, enclosed hydroponic farming. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know to answer that question. <laughs> no problem. It's Stuart, interesting though. It would be interesting. Um, Stuart Grove is asking, how many years after a farmer is paid for the carbon credits, do they need to continue to prove that the soil carbon is still being locked away? Yeah, good question, Stuart. So currently under the Australian Carbon Farming Initiative, there are two, there are two project periods. One is 25 years and one is 100 years. Wow. So... And there's a different discount associated with those two timeframes, but you need to hold the carbon you sequester and get credited for, for that entire period. Um, you also, if you hypothetically increase your soil carbon, generate a credit, and then do something intentional to decrease the carbon again, you then actually have to pay back some of that credit. I should say that's never actually happened and things like drought and force majeure don't require you to pay back credit, but then to get more, you have to get above what you already had. Um, so that's, yeah, okay. they're, they're the timeframes. Um, Arthalv's asking, what are the problems faced in increasing the global reach of the company? Uh, yeah, I mean, all mark, I mean, there are many. Um, the the different taxation and importation regimes, like I'm just trying to import some tech into the US right now and it's very difficult. Uh, um, so I think importation tax regimes, also global supply chains at the moment are very disrupted. Postage is very delayed. Mm. Um, it makes things very difficult. It, it, it's improving things for our competitive context in Australia, but it is making it harder to roll out in other, in other countries. 
Uh, Benjamin's asking, does your measurement, uh, does your measurement done only on the surface or first metre, or are you testing also the soil at a deeper level? Yeah. So under the Australian legislation, you can actually sequester carbon up to 1.5 metres, and you really are incentivized to do that because the, the greater the depth, the greater the volume, which also means the greater the carbon and the greater the, the credit. So we would always encourage landholders to sample to as close to 1.5 metres as possible. To, to generate predictions on, on that soil, you do have to extract the core and sample along the core. There is no technology that exists yet that allows you to sit on the surface and, and see the profile of soil yeah. carbon through. I, I would say soil is very complicated. And we don't know a lot and we don't know what we don't know. It's a, it's a highly heterogeneous material that does require you, your sensor being very close to exactly what you're trying to measure. Gregory Hancock's asking, presume the instrument works using spectroscopy. We know it does. Um, uh, Mid-infrared, uh, how does the instrument measure soil carbon at depth? We've already covered that. Um, do you need to dig? We've already covered that. So yes, it uses spectroscopy, but is it mid-infrared? Yeah, no, it is not mid-infrared. It's a good question. We use near-infrared, NIR spectroscopy, and we are using a range of wavelengths between 400 nanometers and 2,550 nanometers. The issue with mid-infrared spectroscopy is that it requires a lot more preparation and it's a bit more expensive to use, but it is something we're looking at as our technology evolves, evolves in the future. And last question from Tim Dixon, how much of a concern is IP protection for home? You invest millions in groundbreaking technology and then a Chinese startup copies the technology and gets to market at a lower cost and a larger scale, for example. Yeah. so. The, this is a challenge a lot of companies face. The, we have some IP and patents associated with our technology, but really the real value is in our full suite. So it's not just the hardware or the, or the sensor, it's how the hardware links to the software, how the software then links to the user's apps and actually the, the, the knowledge economy that sits across the top of those three pieces as well. It is, it is quite hard to fully replicate, but then if someone wanted to fully replicate what we've done and accelerate carbon sequestration, well, we'd still be achieving our, our mission. And, and as I said before, this challenge is so big and the market is so huge. Um, we actually, we welcome competition and people trying to copy what we what we do, um, but currently we certainly believe we're, we're the best at it and we'll keep learning and, and growing as we go. Fantastic. Phil, thank you so much for your time today. I know how busy you are, so uh, we really appreciate you being able to um, uh, join us this morning. Um, I'm just going to quickly just pass on a couple of um, messages that we've got. Um, if you can just bear with me um, one second, it would be great if I could actually find where it is, sorry. Oh, there he is. So, share screen never gets easier, does it? Okay, so um, just letting you know about a couple of opportunities that we've got um, on the horizon, both in terms of programs as well as events. So applications are currently open for our Female Founders Program. We're delighted to bring this to um, the female founders of the Newcastle region in partnership with the City of Newcastle. So if you're uh, at early stage ideation or pre-startup stage in particular, we're really looking forward to receiving applications and supporting up to 10 female teams through a pre-accelerator program um, over the next few months. Applications close this Sunday, so for more information, please head to the website. Um, tomorrow we have uh, an ideas collider, which is like a little mini hackathon. It goes through about an hour and a half. Um, so if, you, if you're curious about the world of hackathons and ideation, uh, this is a really great toe dipping exercise. It's done virtually and we're doing it in partnership again with the city of Newcastle and Hunter Water. Uh, it's all around the concept of water security. So coming up with solutions for particular problem statements around water security, which we know is really, really important resource. 
um, in our regions. Um, and so that's happening tomorrow um, at, from 11 o'clock. Um, and then later this month, we have a Join the Dots, which, are, which is our monthly networking event, which we use the incredible IC virtual conferencing platform to be able to actually do the best we can in networking in a virtual environment. It's a really great platform if you haven't used it before. And this month's theme is all about circular economy. Uh, and so we've got, we've invited some um, startup founders, researchers, business owners that are working in the field of circular economy. So jump on into that one on, the, on Wednesday, the 29th of September. And our next startup stories is in two weeks on Wednesday, the 6th of October. And it's with Amanda Falconer, who is from Bestie Kitchen. Um, we also have the New Futures Hackathon for water security. So uh, again, leaning on that theme of water security, if you're really wanting to jump into the world of hackathons, um, this is the one for you. It takes place over a 10 hour period um, over the 15th and 16th of October. It's coinciding with Spark Festival and again, brought to you by the city of Newcastle and Hunter Water as well. So please um, do join us for that one. We can't wait to see what the solutions are. Some people develop to the problem statements that have been presented by Hunter Water in that one. If you're curious about innovation and entrepreneurship, you've got an idea, but you don't know where to start, Entrepreneurship 101 is the program for you. Uh, it's an online uh, five module program that you can do in your own time. So um, if you wanna uh, learn a little bit more about the fundamentals of um, entrepreneurship and starting up, this is a great program. And if you're a little further along the journey and you started your company and you're looking for support, um, please feel free to make an EOI to our Venture Mentor Service um, program as well. Um, the website for that one is newcastle.edu.au slash VMS. Again, thank you so much, Phil. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We hope you have a really great day and we're looking forward to seeing you at the next Startup Stories. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, I2N. See you.